Hey there, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevin Davani. Um, really happy to announce to you my next interview with Roman Snitko. You're going to love this interview because it was live, face to face, on a wonderful boat trip in Halong uh, during um, or after the event uh, the conference, Crypto Economics Conference 2020, a purely you know Bitcoin conference on the economical forces behind Bitcoin, uh, with a lot of you know prominent and very knowledgeable Bitcoiners. So really happy to have met them. And since uh, Roman Snitko was also one of the discussion participants during the uh, panel discussion, um, survivable ecosystem. Um, so that's why, you know, I, I chose this title because it's about, you know, in total, what does it mean? What, because he's uh, one of the co-founders uh, and, and of, of, of HODL HODL, a decentralized exchange platform. So I wanted to know, you know, like, what are the obstacles? What service does it really create? Uh, you know, what value does it create for for people, especially for people in uh, hyperinflationary, sanctioned, embargoed countries? You know, people having uh, really existential problems and and just want to, you know, get their hands on some uh, satoshi, some Bitcoin. Uh, what do they need to do? Is it user friendly? What are the obstacles, or challenges? What's the roadmap, the vision behind Huddle Huddle? And in general, you know, I mean, I always wanted to know Roman's story and journey to Bitcoin. What what drove him? What's his passion, um, motivation? Um, what is his personal bigger uh, picture and vision for Bitcoin in total, in totality, and for Huddle Huddle in this context? So, yeah. Um, Hope you're gonna love it as much as I did. It's uh, one of the highest quality uh, um, recordings I've ever done because it was done with professional equipment, face to face, personally. So uh, that's why that's reason you know that's the real reason I'm looking for sponsors so I can go more often to those conferences, events, symposiums, whatever it is, and do these interviews in highest quality, face to face. So let me know if you have any questions afterward. Um, I really enjoyed this talk with Roman Snitko. Uh, my email address is hello at the totalconnector.com. Follow, subscribe, retweet, please. And so uh, help me in any shape or form so I can get this out, uh, bigger exposure. Uh, and yeah, thanks so much for supporting, for listening. Hey, Roman. Welcome to my show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. No, really glad. Uh, we're here on the... Halong, which should which I call it? Halong Bay, a cruise ship, nostalgic, romantic ship. Nighttime. <laughs> yeah. And it's actually not, you know, vacation, but it feels like vacation. Uh, even though we both have to return uh, home, you got to wake up very early. So, um, uh, Roman, thanks so much again for your time. Um, um, I met you briefly. We never talked to one another. I think last time we, I was in Riga. Um, so... I had Max Max Kaidun, your colleague, friend, corporation co partner, founder, yeah, co-founder. Um, I think it's amazing what you guys have done, and uh, especially since last time you uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you open sourced the Huddle Huddle. Well, we still haven't because it, it it takes a lot of time to do that right, and we're still on the way there. The plan is yes, we are going to open source the exchange, and uh, um, we're gonna license other uh, companies or individuals to use the code so yeah mm -hmm. that's the plan but it's still it's still taking some time to do properly because and it's and the you know benign things like uh, cleaning up the code so that other people are able to easily use that uh, code and uh, have no problems deploying the exchange so we, we're not involved in sub technical support and, and stuff like that Right. Um, we were just talking previously privately with you know with the, the, all the other Bitcoiners who are attending uh, the Crypto Economics Conference. I was gonna you know uh, mention the context. Um, wonderful, um, what, what should I call it? Is was it a summit or a conference in Hanoi? Uh, yeah, and unfortunately, due uh, to uh, the threat of the virus, not a lot of people made it. I would still call it a conference, as you know interesting opinions and then people exchanged uh, opinions in telegram chat rooms while the conference was going so i think that was that was really great it's something that actually uh, the baltic anti lacked right. so that's a very interesting concept definitely so 
Roman, you um, you were just explaining a little bit, maybe you should go a little bit into detail um, about your journey into, you know, why don't you tell me, tell my listeners your journey into Bitcoin and how you got into this whole project of HODL HODL? What was the passion, the drive behind it? Yeah, so uh, I think it was 2011 when I first heard the word, and that's because Hacker News, and for those of your listeners who don't know what it is, Hacker News is the number one website for um, programmers and engineers. It's um, Y Combinator company, um, Y Combinator um, accelerator, startup accelerator that runs the website, and and uh, uh, programmers just discuss uh, various things there. And at the time, in 2011, half of the front page of Hacker News was about Bitcoin. And I distinctly remember this uh, post there describing how Gavin and Andreessen uh, was called by the CIA. And we're like, oh, that's interesting. That That's, well, what is Bitcoin? Why is CIA involved? And I'm like, okay. And I forgot about that for a year. And then a friend of mine uh, reminded me of, of Bitcoin uh, uh, in 2012, I think. And that was after I got myself familiar with uh, Austrian economics and read all the books, uh, you know, Mrs. Rothbard. And then um, uh, instantly I became, I understood Bitcoin and what it was about. Uh, but I like, to, I, I like to tell people that at the time I didn't have any money to go and buy Bitcoin. So I started going around and trying to convince people to buy it and nobody really believed me. And so eventually uh, I had to buy a little bit myself, but it wasn't like an instance thing that I could have, could have been afford to do because um, I was, I was working on other projects as a software engineer and, you know, had to, uh, had other things to take care of. So um, it was a long, long way to, uh, to um, get to even work on Bitcoin projects. And I think my, my first Bitcoin is actually, I got paid. Uh, to teach someone programming uh, because we were in, on different continents and that was the easiest way to uh, to get paid. Well, that's interesting. So you were literally practically in touch already with Bitcoin. And when you said, you just mentioned you, you know, you start reading Austin economics or, you know, Austin, whatever, like Mises, Hayek, Rothbard. I never finished Mises. That, okay. was, that was, that was really hard. Yeah. The language is just you said you said you you understood bitcoin what 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 is it because this is what you know i always have regrets about like why didn't i understand like monetary properties like what is money what is hard money what is scarcity did you understand those fundamental properties of money not instantly uh, i think it was over time but at the time i was i was actually i remember distinctly it was 2012 or 11 uh about the time when um, when uh, bitcoin was taken off uh, uh taking uh half of the hacker news front, front page and I was really thinking like what is money where does it come from and that was even before I read Austrian economics I was I was really interested in that question and then when I read Rothbard and uh, he explained a lot of things that I was uh, concerned with um, and then you get introduced to Bitcoin and then you see how easy it is to use it and then you see it's not actually a bank it doesn't it's not centralized there's no website that holds your money and you're like, oh, this is interesting. So you can do that, and nobody knows about that. At least at the time, you, there was no chain analysis and you know companies like that. And so you like, oh, well, this is really, really. And the, the price didn't matter even at the time, and I don't think it matters now. Uh, but it's just, yeah, it was fascinating to just receive your first bitcoins, and um, I, I think I even I wrote a book uh, on Ruby and Rails that was the technology that I was using at the time um, and I was trying to sell it and people pirated it so it wasn't a success but uh, one person definitely paid me with Bitcoin uh, so that was uh, that was a lot of fun to just be able to to use that technology and see that oh this is my wallet is like money and nobody nobody really knows and and uh, there's no way to stop this so it was more of a practical realization uh, but of course, it, it did require a little bit of uh, a background in Austrian economics. Are you someone who questions fundamentally, like from early on? I mean, you're pretty young, I guess. How old are you, may I ask? 34. 34. Okay, I'm 48. I mean, I feel, you know, still young in my heart and soul. But are you someone who started very early questioning, you know, the fundamental matrix, the st structures, the centralization, authorities, government, nation state? 
banks, central banks, or whatever. No, no, I, just, I didn't have those. I didn't even know about those words until I, um, I, I read Austrian economics books, and specifically Rothbard. I think opened my eyes to a lot of things. I never considered myself someone who would, you know, uh, be an activist or anything. No, I was not interested in that. I was just uh, interested in programming. But at the same time, I, I was, I, I think programmers, especially in the 1990s and, and uh, 2000s, uh, uh, th that was the um, sort of the frontier where uh, we could see we were the people who could p do things without permission. We can just write code and make it work. And that was magic, right? Mm -hmm. We didn't require any licenses or any, and still doesn't require any license, although some people push for it, right? And uh, so it was more of a you know natural thing to a natural progression rather than something that I was like oh I'm an anarchist or oh, I'm this and that I'm not an anarchist uh, I'm not I don't even know I don't I used to think that I maybe was a libertarian when I, I read Rothbard at this point I don't even know it's just uh, yeah I, I what what's that feeling when you said oh uh, like like it sounds like a feeling like is it more sort of I'm creating something and creating through that, like whatever it is, coding, programming, product development, and you create you 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 create that feeling of independence. What is that? What is it? Well, you create something out of nothing, basically. Mm -hmm. Like you you don't require other people, uh, and that's what Satoshi basically did. If, if it was one person, right? You can just write code and see how that code is actually useful, and other people uh, are benefiting from from your program or app, right? And that's that's fantastic. And that gives you this power to change things without permission. Um, and I think a lot of programmers are, that's why, I mean, naturally the, the, the software engineers are, were the first ones who um, were early adopters of Bitcoin, I think. Not just them, but in general, people involved in IT and software business. Um, but the feeling is, yeah, just being able to build something, to just write a bunch of words and, and make them even more powerful than, uh, than a writer can make words. So that, that's something, but I always compared programming to, uh, like rock music in the seventies, right? In the eighties. Um, and I think I'm not a big fan of, um, uh, Bowie, but he once said that, uh, I just really, for, for those of you fans of David Bowie, I don't like his voice, but he. But he gave a very famous interview in yes, 1999. I, yeah, I said, that's what I was going to say. Where Jeff Bezos, you know, came out with Amazon. Nobody mm -hmm, understood what mm -hmm. the fuck he was doing. Uh, that was that's amazing. Yep. This interview, he was like, I mean, unfortunately, it's dead. Right, but when, when did yeah, he, he die? Yeah, he died. He died. He yeah. died a while ago. But I, I, I know the interview you're referring to, and that was really an amazing interview. He's really. Um, uh, predicting things and uh, one of the things he said I think it was the same interview he said that uh, I, he always felt like uh, he got into rock music simply because it was the frontier back then right it was something that they tried to do permission without permission that they were um, you know maybe not disrespect authority but challenging authority back then that was the reason why he got into rock music and uh, he said these days I would be doing internet because that's where things are. And I feel I always felt the same way about, about programming, right? I, I have friends who are, uh, um, who are much better programmers than I am. And I always told them, well, you guys are naturals, right? And I, I am here only because I uh, feel like this is something where I can change things. And I try to be as, as you know, I try to be better every day and study and, and learn. But um, yeah, I'm here because, and B Bitcoin is a big part of that, being able to change things. All right. Let's talk about Hal Hal. What's the vision behind it? What is the re the really bigger picture for you? Just for you. So, I think at this point, because when we started, we didn't really know what we were getting into. I think it was a very stupid assumption that we made that at some point, other exchanges, um, like local, well, other peer-to-peer -peer exchanges and local bitcoins. I think it w was the only one and maybe Paxful was around, I'm not sure. But when we started, we had this assumption that at some point they are going to uh, start doing KYC ML uh, and they would start requiring 
all all the papers from the users to and, and start the verification process that's required that's going to be required and that's what actually happened and i'm saying i'm saying i'm saying that that was a stupid assumption because uh it like they didn't do that uh like two years passed and we already launched huddle huddle and they still hadn't done that at that point but luckily for us yeah they they like it was 2018 i think uh when it became a requirement of local bitcoins to do kyc ml for every user and this is when we started seeing the influx of users um and they started using huddle huddle uh more actively um but even then like everything changes every year we 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 don't know where we actually go and we have plans we have certain assumptions about the future and one of those assumptions is this idea that we based our whole platform on is multi-sig i think right now what we're doing with it we're allowing people to exchange fiat money fiat currency into bitcoin and back with multi-sig and that allows us to be non-custodial that is we don't hold any bitcoins but the assumption is right now that we can use it for pretty much anything for any kind of contracts and also we don't have to hold any of the keys at all so we can just be a, a software provider basically um, so if you need to um, if you have freelancers and those people who need to build websites and they're all in different parts of the world um, and you have a freelance uh, website that lists freelancers and lists offers uh, from people who want to to build websites they connect them and then they use us as an escrow service basically and the beauty of the the idea is that um, the contract itself can be paid in fiat currency or any other payment method that those two parties prefer mm -hmm. uh, but they still use Bitcoin as an escrow mechanism right mm -hmm. so um, I think that this idea can be used for many many different kinds of markets uh, and freelance websites is just one example and what we want to build right now is just generic platform that uh, pretty much any any market website such as freelance uh, freelance websites or you know i think that they would be able to easily use that without even understanding bitcoin that's the beauty of it they don't have to to know anything about the protocol anything at all they would just use the api or even just if you if you don't have a market but you have users you need to connect somehow just create a contract using a simple ui um, that's what we're aiming at that's our goal in the context in relation to fiat cash paper money isn't that i mean it, when, the more the more i think about it the more ridiculous it, it just it just becomes the thought of it you know giving all my data you don't know your customer, uh, anti-money laundering regulations. I mean, if I have some fiat, whatever that is, uh, Chinese renminbi, or yen, and you have some euro, and we just exchange. I mean, who who would come interfere with the two of us and make a KYC uh, pro procedure? I mean, what do you, what do you think about this whole KYC? Pro uh, well, if if you if you think about it um, more generally, right? Um, a lot of people say like well this is you know for um, this is because they want to catch terrorists or you know uh, those people who try to avoid taxes and all of that and that's part of it um, which might be a good part depending on your v political views um, uh, nobody I mean most people I hope don't that they don't don't like terrorists at all but um, the point is I think um, for the most part, KYC ML is, uh, is in place, is a system in place to keep um, funding away from the projects that uh, are not um, allowed, that the current s financial system or political system does not want uh, around, to have around, does not want, they don't want them funded. And Bitcoin kinds of, it, it gets around this and allows uh, those projects to be funded and one interesting example of that is pineapple fund um that came around two years ago i think three years ago mm -hmm. right 
Um, so for those of you who don't know, uh, just Google it, Pineapple Fund. Very interesting. Um, so I think this is why we have those policies. It's, it's presented to us as something that, that's there for, to, you know, to, to catch bad guys. But in reality, it's not that. It's just uh, that they can immediately stop your money from going into any place that they don't like. And by they, I, I mean many different things and institutions, right? depending on the place you're living at, you know, jurisdiction and everything. So know your customer. I mean, the fact that I'm, I mean, every, every, let's say, every exchange out there, every normal, so an ordinary exchange has this KYC AML regulations in place, right? Actually not. If, no? you, if you look at BitMEX, the reason they were able to avoid um, that, at least for now, is because, first of all, they are registered in the right jurisdiction, I think. Um, and I'm sure they have, um, you know, a thousand lawyers <laughs> making sure they're not, um, well, they're not breaking laws, uh, or at least too many of them. Um, and they're making a lot of money. And the other reason they are able to do that is because they don't deal with fiat at all, mm -hmm. right? It's a futures exchange. So people just get Bitcoin on it, and then they practically bet on where the Bitcoin price is going to be. Um, and so they are able to practically bypass um, this need to have a bank account right and that solves a lot of problems but for how long that's the question because they got too big i think mm -hmm. and um yeah they, they're very very rich i guess mm -hmm. so who knows what's going to happen to them so who are the people who are going to huddle huddle who, are, who what, what kind of people are using it would you say um i think uh, mostly it's people who um are from third world countries who do not have those countries don't have a regular uh, don't have regulated exchanges and um they ha there are two types right the speculators um who have access to regular exchanges outside of those countries and then they can arbitrage right they do can they can do arbitrage and, and make money that way and sell bitcoin or buy bitcoin with a premium on our platform and then there are regular people who just you know want to buy or sell at uh at the market price or below or above whatever it is but they just want to sell or buy and they don't speculate it's just what they need to i don't know send money to their parents or you know things like that i think that's the majority of the, those are two types of traders in our exchange um yeah, we talk to traders all the time. And the interesting thing is they themselves, they don't know much about Bitcoin. They ask us questions all the time. Like, you know, what is a, um, a lot of people, a lot of uh, traders who, who um, trade relatively high volumes, they cannot even distinguish between what is a Bitcoin address and a Bitcoin wallet, which is surprising, right? Or like, what is it? confirmation like we had to explain those things to them because it's important because we are non-custodial and every contract uh is associated with a bitcoin transaction actually two bitcoin transactions you deposit bitcoins into escrow and then withdraw from there so is it easy i mean what's the feedback of the can the average user new, uh, use it yeah i think it's not more complex than local bitcoins because it's pretty much you're, you still need to to send money to local bitcoins and right. then get get them out of local bitcoins it's, the only difference is that you do that for every contract on lock, on huddle huddle uh, but it's easy the interface is easy once you get through and we also have a uh, uh, we also have the testnet version mm -hmm. so you don't need to risk anything before you go and try with not with non real bitcoins so in that in that process okay i i deposit and i withdraw there is uh is there a trusting issue like a, a question of reliability reliability trust so like i said we are non-custodial and what that means is um we cannot um when you when you deposit 
bitcoins into escrow. This escrow address is actually generated using three keys. Mm -hmm. One key belongs to the seller, one key belongs to the buyer, and one key belongs to HODL HODL. And it, uh, it, re it requires two out of the, those three keys to um, unlock the funds from that escrow address and send them anywhere. Right, and um, if the contract uh, is completed and everyone agrees on the outcome, then um, the seller would normally sign that transaction. And by signing the transaction, it's actually very e easy in their interface. He just mm -hmm. enters his, what we call a payment password. Um, and um, that payment password decrypts his private key which is then used to sign the transaction in the front end. We, can, we don't really store um, his private key or any other private keys of our users. And uh, then we co-sign that transaction in, in the back end and broadcast it to the network. And this whole, now we have an API to do that. And so the whole process is even more um, transparent. So a lot of people on our Telegram group, a lot of our users, um, they asked us questions about like how that works and you know whether we actually they didn't understand even that at first that we are non-custodial so we had to go through a lot of ex ex explaining and we have videos on youtube we have a support team that is always there to explain things and so people just uh are still in the process of learning and understanding the difference but yes we it's it's still easy and uh um and we can't send money mm -hmm. without permission of our users we can't withdraw them arbitrarily from that escrow address it does not belong to us so there were there have been no irregularities it's like it's really running smooth like uh, well, are they have there ever been like problems like with yeah sure there's uh, there's some problems so for example um we're still um in the process of implementing uh this thing called rbf which which is uh, short for replace by fee transaction um which uh basically means that if you send a transaction to our escrow address uh with a lower than usual fee it may get stuck and not confirmed and the other party is waiting and we have a so-called payment window for each contract which makes like let's say your payment window six hours and you set a very low transaction fee and then your transaction is still unconfirmed and the contract gets canceled uh, and in that case you can you can refund yourself but then you lose on the transaction fee twice right not nice uh, plus the other party may say oh jesus i wasted my time on that guy right so what uh, a lot of people and well not a lot of but some people end up doing they uh end up resending the transaction with a higher fee and our system unfortunately <laughs> does not support it very well so we have to handle the case manually mm -hmm. we're, st we're so yeah there are like issues like that they're technical in their nature um and uh we and, and there's a bunch of other things but we are in the process of solving them and making it even easier to um so shit always happens i mean it's, it's yeah it's, yeah it, it's a good sign that you know when, yeah. when you get a lot of problems it means okay people are using the platform wow yeah exactly it's a trial and error i mean in every you know um development or product development technology uh, i was going to ask you is there a standardized transaction fee like what's 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 the what's the what's the percentage um so when people send money to escrow to the escrow address the transaction fee is defined by their wallet right mm -hmm. so you can set whatever they mm -hmm. want then when they withdraw we have a setting uh in each user in, in their account settings has a setting that says okay i want high average or low transaction fee on upon withdrawal or you can they can even set it manually so there's no um ambiguity there you can set whatever you want and so if you are the one who's supposed to receive the funds whether it's refunding yourself as a seller or or when you're a buyer who's supposed to get money get bitcoins from escrow yeah that's that's the fee that you're going to get um when the transaction is broadcasted by hollow hollow what's what's the average fee let's say okay i take like you know i choose oh i'm sorry you were talking yeah. about so right yeah. right right you were talking about the uh the hodl hodl's fee right exactly. the, i'm sorry uh, yeah mm -hmm. the uh the hodl hodl fee is uh 
zero point six percent compared to all other um, peer to peer Bitcoin exchanges. That's much lower. So local Bitcoin charges one percent. I think Pax was the same. Mm-hmm. Uh, but 0.6 is actually not average. It's like the highest fee you can get in the huddle huddle. There's referral program. There's a bunch of other things. So for example, if you, um, if you stay online on, or on huddle huddle for eight hours in to- uh, out of 24, your fee drops down to 0.5%. Mm-hmm. Uh, things like that, you know, that incentivizes users to, um, be more accessible, um, so that other people know you're ready to jump in and, and uh fulfill the contract Mm -hmm. so and it's also it's it's also important to note that that fee is divided between the users right Mm -hmm. so in in actuality you're as a as a trader you're actually paying 0.3 percent oh that's pretty low yeah it is yeah that's why we're not making a lot of money (laughs) yeah exactly because i mean i don't want to name it now but there is an exchange that has or is known has a reputation of having one of or the lo- the lowest ex- transaction fees i think it's about 0.2 percent. but um do you know or can you talk about like what countries from which countries are those users mostly uh using your platform yeah how long um so i think it's uh latin america we have a, a large community there eastern european countries asian countries uh i don't we don't see a lot of users from europe or north america well actually us us as a country uh is not allowed on the exchange so uh mm-hmm. for regulatory reasons we just don't want to go there at all any Plus, other any other countries that are uh yeah a bunch of other countries uh like uh iran uh so we used yeah i think iran's is going to be out of the exchange for a while which beca- because at some point i think we we tr- we attempted to penetrate the market and uh, we even have a translation yeah. into persian but unfortunately it it looks like they were not interested we had like a, a telegram group there with a bunch of people from well like a lot of people and all they were doing was just talking and they didn't want to actually use the platform we're like okay well i guess like what's the point like nobody like, we we didn't have a single trade uh, there so we're like okay it doesn't it's not worth it um given the current situation we would love we would love to be everywhere but unfortunately the reality of that is that um you know we, we want to write code and not fight the regulators and other uh, um, and other agencies that you know might get us in trouble and given that our exchange is going to be open source anyway well maybe someone just uses our code and builds an exchange for iran in iran and then it's easier for their market um to understand because we were not able to convince the iranians to use our exchange Mm -hmm. interesting Mm -hmm. um what's what's your what's your perspective what's your point of view on coin mixing do do most or do you think most users with it, let's say they withdraw you know the, the bitcoin from hodl hodl is i mean are there is there any are there any stats like analytics or like, no i mean we don't track that yeah um i think coin mixing is one of the techniques for uh you know greater anonymity mm-hmm. um and also think uh, th- anonymity as a feature comes with a price. Mm-hmm. It's never going to be something standard. A lot of people like the idea, but not a lot of people are, prefer- are, are prepared to pay the price. And the price is there for sure. So whether it's like just understanding how to do that or actual transaction fees. What I think is important is that Bitcoin remains um, uncensorable that's much more important so and i mentioned that in my talk at the conference it's more important that people are actually able to fund the projects and send money where wherever they want to send them rather than stay anonymous a lot of people don't want to stay anonymous they can um you know in in countries that are under sanctions Mm -hmm. uh, from other countries they might want to um you know do let's say um you were in a country that is sanctioned by the U- United States and you want to buy a house in a third uh, in a third country, right? Mm-hmm. Now that third country doesn't have any problem with your country, but unfortunately to, to be able to buy that house, you need to uh, transfer money from your bank account to their bank account. 
And that goes through a correspondent bank that is in the United States or uh, European Union, and then you have a problem. Mm -hmm. And so that basically implies censorship, right? Uh, you're not doing anything illegal, but you still cannot send the money. Now, Bitcoin solves that problem, and uh, I think it's much more important than anonymity. Um, anonymity is a nice thing sometimes, and sometimes it's not. Like, um, uh, it, it, indeed, it can be used for things that are illegal, and most people would agree are immoral as well. So there's no question about that. But um, for those things, I, I don't want to sound like, you know, I don't want to repeat... Um, uh, a thousand other people saying that um, Ill illegal things can be bought and sold using many other payment methods and not just Bitcoin. Right, right. So, Roman, um, w w do you see like a trajectory, like a, you know, a, a number of users exponentially increasing right now or in the next few weeks, months and years to come? Do you mean on our platform yeah. or Bitcoin yeah, in general? Yeah, platform on Hover. Well, yeah, we, we are seeing uh, more users every day. I'm not tracking the numbers. I'm just writing code on the CTO, right? Uh, and, and not just, I'm, I'm not even managing people, to be honest. Like, I'm, not, I'm just writing code just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's my job, <laughs> not manage things. So I don't even track those things. But uh, my co-founder uh, is tracking those things. And... Um, uh, he tells me, yeah, and I, I see that myself. Like I go um, and check, uh, oh, oh, there seems like there are more offers and there's a better price in those offers. So yeah, definitely. Uh, it's getting better. I don't think it's it's fast enough uh, and I'm fine with it. I'm just, I just want to work on things and, and uh, make things better for users. That's all. Um, we're there for the long term, mm -hmm. in my opinion. And uh, yeah, we're working on exciting things, I, I suppose. So um, uh, I would sometimes go on, te on our Telegram group and uh, a lot of users um, complain about things. Oh, you don't get this right and this right. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, go use local Bitcoins or whatever you want. I don't care. I'm just writing code here. And Max is like, uh, now I have a, a, a badge uh, on Telegram in our uh, whole, whole group that says toxic CTO. <laughs> And that's what I try to to be, uh, just to encourage people in this mm -hmm. weird way to, uh, you know, get real and, and mm -hmm. get a sense of perspective, like where you are really. Like we have a lower commission, <laughs> you know, no right. KYC ML, and you guys are complaining, a better UI, you're still complaining. Well, I guess, <laughs> what can I say? What, 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 okay, what do you think about UX, UI, like user experience, user-friendly, you know, usage of... I mean, is there a demand? Like, are people asking for, you know, a smoother, slicker, sexier interface, user experience, or what's um, the what's I personally, I personally think uh, that it's much more important to, there's, so there, there's this um, um, binary view of startups um, that people sometimes employ. Uh, they say it, your startup is either a pill or a candy. Mm -hmm. and what I try to be is to be a pill, mm -hmm. right? That solves an actual problem. It's nice to have nice UI. I, um, you know, I, I think we do have better UI and UX than uh, other peer-to-peer -peer platforms. Mm -hmm. But in terms of ease of uh, use, uh, it's a peer-to-peer -peer exchange. It's never going to be easy mm -hmm. uh, for many, many reasons. And so, yeah, we're working on it constantly, but. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if people want it bad enough and local Bitcoins, uh, you know, they were the pioneers and we we're big fans of them, actually. And I think their interface pretty much sucks. But people use them because they learned how to use it once. And that's about it. And that's the whole story. They keep, do they keep using them ever since. Mm -hmm. So where do you see, where do you see, or what kind of challenges do you see um, future to come? Um, for you personally, or when it comes to <laughs> programming, or you know, putting all your commitment and work. Sometimes it's very hard um, to um, uh, to find motivation mm. to keep on going. So we went through cycles. M me and my co-founder and the whole team. I think it's they they, they sense it, um, and uh, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. 
I know we want to build very good things that we believe are good for the world and Bitcoin. And uh, who knows what's going to happen? I mean, it's just hard to predict those things. I I feel like right now we're on the track. We're in the path to something good. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes one of us uh, would lose motivation and, and, you know, then the other one would. That's I, I think it's. It's, it's such a benign thing to say that it's, it's very important to have a co-founder, right? But it is in a way. So we support each other. It's very good. And the team as well, you know, they're, um, they're great. So it's so important. The team, you know, teamwork, team, team dynamic. Um, I was going to ask you, um, so, so hot hot is, is principally usable as a desktop version, right? I mean, is it, or is it an app? or planned no it's just a website just and website can, yeah and we have a pretty good uh mobile version for it as okay, well okay gotcha so okay. it's not uh we don't want to go and uh supporting android and and ios is a pain in the ass and <laughs> lots of effort and, and time mm -hmm. and uh yeah why do that uh no reason if it works from a browser uh, whether it's on a mobile device or a desktop device then it's fine um yeah so it's i think no need for uh, native support of any other platform is needed. I mean, is required. So, but there could become like, uh, could a triggering point, a, a, like a turning point, come? Um, you know, because of external factors, whatever, like crisis, crashes, or uh, whatever. You know, uh, supply chains breaking down, like like exogenous factors that could create like a massive demand in using. Huddle, huddle. Well, uh, that, that, that would be that would be great for us. We're I wouldn't say we're a hundred percent prepared for it, but we would do our best. One of the things that I can tell you um, now we have the API uh, and SDK associated with that API. What that means basically is that people can can code their own bots or integrate our exchange into mm -hmm. their own wallets, and that's actually what Blue Wallet did. They used our API, and now you can trade as far, or maybe so very soon you'll be able to trade through Blue Wallet on your mobile device. Which is a custodial wallet, right? Uh, I don't even. Uh, somebody I, told me that today. Like, like it's a custodial wallet. I and... don't. I don't think so, but I'm not sure because I'm not. I wasn't in charge of, mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. the integration, so you have to talk to Max about that. But um, yeah, they're using our API, and a bunch of other wallets are interested. And I know people are writing bots to trade on our exchange. So it becomes easier um, for them to uh, fill all of the orders. And uh, yeah, we, we see the in the increase in volume, even though it's not enough, right? It's not enough still, but it's getting better. Um, that's for sure. And the liquidity in return also could. So the liquidity is an interesting question for, um, is an interesting term to use for peer-to-peer -peer exchanges because um, there's no liquidity actually there's just offers mm -hmm. and those offers until somebody creates a contract with you and until somebody funds that contract you cannot say for sure that there's money in there so is it liquidity I'm not sure it's just a bunch of offers there and when people they used to come to our telegram group and complain there's like, oh there's no liquidity there it's like why would I trade a whole whole well go ahead and create an offer like doesn't cost you anything mm -hmm. and then set the price that you would like to set there and 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 wait or maybe lower your or make it higher mm -hmm. if, if you're buying and then somebody would create a contract with you so i'm not sure liquidity is the right term to use for um peer-to-peer -peer exchanges but I, I get what people are saying yeah mm -hmm. it's probably worse than it's still worse than local bitcoins but local bitcoins volumes have, were dropping and we we've seen an uh, exodus of users from local bitcoins to our platform because finally they realized oh kyc ml that's what it is that's a pain in the ass right mm -hmm. and they don't they just don't want to do that because even if those big traders they trade on local bitcoins and they are they were prepared to go through kyc ml and then the small fish that traded with them, they were not prepared to do that. Mm. And so they got no one left to trade with. <laughs> and so they were like, okay, maybe we should move someplace else. Right. All right. 
So Roman, um, w do you have like a future vision, like for f um, not only you know in connection with with Hoddle Hoddle, but w where do you see where do you see Bitcoin? Not price. I, mean, I don't mean price, but w w do you do you see people more and more grasping, comprehending the fundamental potential of of Bitcoin? I don't think a lot of people, my impression is that uh, the price might go up, might go down. It might, I think there's some potential for it to go up in the future. But in general, I think for the most part, people don't think about freedom too much. Mm -hmm. They don't really use Bitcoin to, um, you know, they don't read Austrian economics. They don't, they're not interested in that. And I think Eric Voskel is kind of right when he's, I think it's him who said that, yeah, most people use it as a speculative tool uh, and uh, it's st it still holds true, I think. Um, I see Bitcoin's future more like Linux, I guess. So people don't even know what it is, but everybody actually uses Linux if they're using an Android phone. Mm. Um, I mean, once again, it's a benign thing to say. It's not going to be exactly like that, but something along the lines of that. And uh, even if like 10% of the world uses Bitcoin and everybody else doesn't care, that's still a lot. That's really, really a lot. And um, that's still a good future because a bunch of people can use Bitcoin and feel and get more freedom than they would get otherwise. Right. I think it's a good thing. Awesome. Roman, thank you so much. I think <laughs> it's a lot of to digest, uh, but really fascinating your story, your journey and, and your whole perspectives on, on how, how you understand you know, Bitcoin and, and why you're doing this, you know, your motive, your drive, what drives you. you know, it's, that's what I wanted to know, especially. So um, where can people find you or hodl hodl? Any resources you want to share? Right. So I'm on Twitter and my Twitter handle is Roman it up. Um, and uh, yeah, Huddle Huddle is uh, is a website, is our platform. You can just it, it's spelled hodl hodl dot com, no spaces. This is where you can trade Bitcoin for your useless fiat currency. And we also have a Telegram group um, for many different languages. I think we have a, a Spanish community, um, Russian speaking community on Telegram. Then there's a, a Telegram group for Asia. And there's also a main Telegram group um, where you can you can just join and ask us questions. If you don't understand anything, there's always someone from our team ready to jump in and answer. Um, so yeah, don't hesitate to do that. We're mainly on Telegram and Twitter. Awesome. Looking real forward to seeing you at the next event, hopefully wherever you that know, be, I'm, Asia, I'm, Europe. Or yeah, yeah, Baltic any better. Unless we cancel it, hopefully we won't. Max yeah. des definitely doesn't want to cancel it. <laughs> And uh, yeah, hope to see you there. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me. I really enjoy the conversation and your questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hey there. So, how'd you like? How did you love my awesome interview with Roman Sitko of Huddle Huddle? He's a really great personality and a really interesting person. Um, I really enjoyed this talk with him. I'm gonna repeat this uh, definitely in the future. Um, especially face to face, you know, it's a totally different uh, feeling and, and uh, perception. And also, you know, for for you guys out there, for my fans, for my listeners, subscribers, it's just a different audio quality, different experience. So if you have any questions for Roman Sitko, you know, you can hit him up on, on Twitter. His, um, his Twitter handle is Romanitop. I'm going to put those in the show notes and uh, check out huddlehuddle.com. And I think it's a you know great project, a huge potential, and I think you know with more user friendly access, uh, accessibility, uh, smoothness of UX UI, more liquidity coming in, and you know and in general you know the if once the Bitcoin community, the Bitcoin space matures and and grows exponentially, and more and more people come into you know uh, within this critical adoption rate context. So we're going to have it, we're going to see, we're going to really see unexpected uh, success and, and development and evolution and adoption. And 
at the end of the day, you know, we've got to always ask ourselves, why are we doing this? You know, why, why do we need huddle huddle? Why do we need decentralized, um, censorship resistant, uh, um, uh, platforms or, or technologies, right? Um, yeah. So if you have any questions for me or Roman, um, write me, my email is at hello at the total .com. If you're a Bitcoin sponsor potential one, please get in touch with me. I'd really love to be sponsored by one or two or three Bitcoin, um, you know, entrepreneurs, companies, ethical, you know, companies, ethical entrepreneurs whom I can identify, identify myself with, uh, services, products, values, and yeah, thank you so much for listening, for support and talk to you soon. Bye. Mm -hmm.